Today, we are talking about some of my favorite topics, purpose, personal identity, and career. And I am joined by Emma Last. Emma is the founder of Progressive Minds and has over 20 years of experience in culture change, well-being, coaching, and training. She worked as a director in senior leadership for a large corporation until she came to a turning point in her career and wanted to gain more balance in her own life. Progressive Minds supports professionals and business owners with a solutions focused approach to overall mental health, well-being, and culture change through coaching, training, and mentorship programs. Welcome, Emma. Oh, thank you for having me, Raven. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I am happy to have you, and I'm ready to get into a wonderful conversation about everything. You know, everyone, you know, the career is such a big focus of our entire like lives, right? So much revolves around what we do. So Emma, I think it's very important to set the stage for everyone listening to know more about, you know, work, drive and passion. And I want you to take us back on your own personal journey. Take us back to 2017. Tell us what you were doing in your career and how you were feeling. Okay, so in 2017, there had been, I was working for a large uh, corporate and I'd worked for that corporate for, well, what would have been 18 years. Um, I started with them as a graduate and I worked my way up. I was really, really ambitious and I was um, a senior leader. So I was literally one step below MD. Uh, I managed teams in various locations. I'd had 13 different jobs in those 19 years. Um, and it had been a, you know, a brilliant career path. And almost, you know, I was someone that the company could say, look, this is a success story. This person, you know, this woman has got three children and, and she's, you know, got this, you know, amazing career with us. And she started as a graduate with us and look what we've done to support her. And, um, and actually, for a lot of those years, I was with that organization. I absolutely loved what I did. Um, and people used to say to me, you know, if we cut you open, that I would be the color of the organization. You know, my blood would be blue rather than uh, than, than red. And and that was because I just literally, I, I lived the values and I loved, I loved my work. But um, after kind of restructure, after restructure, there was a second restructure in um, in three years in June, July 2017. And it was kind of that restructure and that made me really start to question if I wanted to be there, really. And I sat in a meeting and this was just a little bit after the restructure. I was really fortunate in that I came out with the promotion and there was other people within the business that had been made redundant or lost their jobs. And, you know, I was really one of the lucky ones. And so I should have felt lucky, but I didn't really feel lucky. And I felt quite cynical and quite distrusting of the environment I was in. I didn't necessarily think that the situation had been handled that well in terms of the process and the support kind of process around it. And we were in a meeting. The MD at the time said, we need to find more passion in our people. And I just sat there and thought, I can't do this anymore. You know, this is, it's not because I'd lost my passion for what I was doing. And looking back on the situation, it wasn't really until I left, I kind of I started to plan my exit then. And by the November, I told them that I was, you know, potentially looking to move on and that I didn't feel happy and they asked me to stay for another three months and just give it another try but I'd really by the Christmas I'd definitely well and truly made my decision that I had to leave it just I was so stressed and it was eating me up inside um, and it wasn't really until I left and 
you know, stopped. And then literally, I just, the person that used to bounce out of bed in the morning at 5.45, you know, and, and would kind of, you know, go to work, I'd stop bouncing out of bed, let's put it that way, it would be more kind of like dragging myself out of bed. But, but when I stopped, I've just literally, I was exhausted. And looking back on it, you know, and it affected my mental health for um, a period of time. And that's why the work I do now is so important to me. So it was really, I just, I was so burnt out. And I didn't notice the signs of burnout. And it was just like, oh, she's not really behaving in the way that she should be behaving. Or I was perhaps quite negative and cynical about certain things. But that's a really, really strong sign of burnout. And actually, as employers, you know, we've got a duty of care to be able to spot those signs as well, as well as actually educating ourselves so that we can start to spot the signs in ourselves as well. I want to I want to talk about that. You know, at the time of this recording, it's it's Mental Health Awareness Month. And I really want to highlight that you can be in an environment, in a job, in a career where it weighs on you emotionally, um, psychologically, your physiology, and to the point of where you said not, not even not even wanting to rise out of the bed with enthusiasm, not enjoying mm-hmm. the work you do, and it affecting you personally, it affecting your home life, and no one needs that. No one wants that. I think this is this is my belief that you should enjoy Monday through Friday, right? There's going to be ups and lows, you know, hills and valleys when you are in the workplace, but it shouldn't be a place where you dread going or as you mentioned, you're distrusting of your leaders, right? When I yeah. think of leadership, I think of you make everyone around you better. Together we can. Together we're better. Yeah. I want you to talk more about some of the signs of burnout because you said at the time you didn't recognize them. What are some of the signs of burnout that an employer can recognize? And then also too, I think that there, when it comes to our mental health, there's a lot of personal responsibility we have. So what are some of the signs as a person you, you can make sure that you are tuned into or aware of if you're in an environment or in a workplace where this is not serving you any longer? I think that the first signs really are those signs potentially of stress or, you know, feeling like you're lacking energy or that you feel you're perhaps reacting to things in a different way. So when I talk to people about stress in the work that I do now is I talk to them about working out is your the stress that you feel is it time and symptom relevant so when I'm talking about that what I mean is if say for example you had a customer complaint you are going to feel stressed at that moment in time but if you still feel stressed and there's not necessarily been a trigger for it then that stress is kind of starting to build over time does that make sense that does that does make sense yes so it, it it's kind of it's it's that way it, it's thinking about that it's about actually just stopping and thinking am i normally um, you know am i reacting the way that i want to react like with my family am i reacting the way i want to react with my um with my children am i reacting the way that i want to react in the workplace so am i kind of perhaps am i withdrawing in myself or am I reacting in a way that is not normally me when I feel more in control? And then kind of as you get a bit further down the signs with burnout, it is more around kind of those, your mind is more of a negative mindset and you become quite critical and quite cynical and not feeling like you're psychologically safe. Often those people that have burnout and are in a difficult situation in a work environment, it can almost be that some conflict comes from somewhere. So um, one of the women that's in my world this year, so she like before Christmas was having, you know, like fallen out with one of her friends, which was really not like her at all. So 
you know, if things are kind of happening to you that you don't think are the norm, those are start to be, you know, our signs. But sometimes the signs of stress are so subtle that you sometimes don't notice it. And where it's, it's with me, it was like, well, actually, I let it build and build and build probably over a 12, 18 month period to the point where it did make me poorly. So it's also it's managing those early signs as well. And thinking about can you, you know, when you those things that light you up or help you to relax. So going out for a walk, for example, or um, whatever the thing is that helps you relax, whether that be going for a walk on a beach or going for a swim or listening to music, when you do that or doing exercise and you think, oh my goodness, I didn't realise how stressed I was until I did that, if Mm. that makes sense. But with me, everything was centred around my work or my children. So my identity became very much about my work. So when I left, it wasn't just about me rebuilding myself it was about me finding a new purpose and me finding like who I really was again because after 19 years in a business I was that business I was you know I had become Emma from x company and or Emma mum I can completely relate to that um, as I transitioned as well from my previous role or previous career there was almost like, I think we talked about this offline, like a bit of grieving something that you lost, right? Or yeah. at the time I thought it was a loss and not even recognizing the gain in it. But I even thought about when you go to a networking event, or even if you just went to lunch with someone or you meet someone, it's like, I'm Raven and I do, or I'm Raven from X organization. And yeah. I felt like, oh, wow, how much of our identity have we attached to our careers? And I am an, a strong advocate of doing great work and really having that love and enjoyment in what you're doing. But when we attach our identity, like it's who I am, especially mm-hmm. when as an, an employee to a, an, a company, to a company, you can have a feeling of loss when you change roles, change industries, change companies. And it's like you are an employee there to do great work. It's yeah. not who you are. And I think when we, and, and it's because we spend so much time and so much investment into learning, training, education. And then when you get in the role, or you get in a particular career, it's always about continuous improvement. How can I up-level my skills? How can I advance my career? So I definitely think I want to make a call out to anyone who feels so attached to a role or career that they've lost their sense of self. And you talked about finding that thing that really, it sounds like, re-centers you um, as a person. Talk to us more about, so you were burned out, right? You were burned out. You started planning your exit. Then what? How did, how did you regain who Emma is um, outside of your, you know, your roles, even as a mom, outside of your role as a mom, outside of your role as um, an employee to this particular company? How did you get centered in who is Emma and what does Emma love? Yeah. So for me, it was like, well, first of all, it was dealing with the, like you said before that I mentioned to you, is that grief is like when you lose, you lose somebody, you you know, it's, you think of it, you lose somebody. But when you look at the grief curve or grief cycle, it's very similar to a change curve. And actually, when you start to kind of see the loss or grief, I was grieving for what I had lost now that loss wasn't necessarily what I wanted but it had been what I wanted for a long time so I kind of had to deal with that um with that loss and adapt to that and um and kind of be quite self-compassionate in some ways to begin with just just to really think right well okay so 
I am feeling like that, but how do I start to kind of rebuild myself and come out the other side of it? So a huge part of it was I need to refine my purpose. Um, the other part was I need to refine me. So I started with that. I literally connected with friends, went and got back um, doing exercise to begin with, I worked, I didn't work a Tuesday at all. I just went and spent time with, played tennis, went to the gym and um, went and had lunch with friends on a Tuesday. That was it. You know, it's like, I need, I need some time for me. So, and I know that sounds really basic, but those were two of the things. The other things that I started to um, evaluate was I was always giving to others and it was like, giving to help people progress in their career, giving to my children, giving to charity in terms of time, being a governor in a school. So everything, a lot of my values were about kind of giving back and giving to people. But when I reevaluated that, it was just a bit like, actually, I'm giving too much of me as well. So that was just something to kind of bear in mind. So giving to others and that reward you get from others actually in the UK in the um, NHS we have five steps to well-being and giving is one of those five ways to well-being however obviously with me it was a different end of the spectrum um, I looked at my learning as well so keep learning was um, an, is an area within the NHS five ways to well-being and that I'd always done learning really that was related to my job and I rediscovered that over time because it had almost been it hadn't been about what do you want to learn what is it that you want that I had kind of almost lost my love of learning so that was kind of a real thing for me because it was just like actually the key area for me that I need to focus on I need to focus on self development Mm. on development that is so good you know after we leave college and we get into the workforce and let's say you're particularly focused in one area or line of work that can become your only thing that you learn about mm -hmm. and it, it's so interesting I was talking to a friend the other day and I, I'm an avid reader I love reading books and she was saying, well, I haven't read a book since college because it was forced reading. So now getting back into the enjoyment of like, what, what would I enjoy reading or studying or learning about or museums? And I also think that's such a, I want to call this out, self-study. Again, that was what we were talking about a few minutes ago. What does Emma enjoy? What is Raven? What, you know, what lights Raven up? And when you get in sync with that, I think you are more intentional about the choices you make for your entire life, right? More intentional about, do I go here? Do I work here? Do I take this opportunity? Do I volunteer here? What's right for me? Because I know me. I know what I enjoy. I know what I'm great at. And I know things that, you know, aren't my cup of tea. So I think that's super um, interesting that you brought up getting to understand yourself, that that self-development. I, I have to circle around, back around to, again, though, when you were talking about stress and employers having a duty of care, mm -hmm. a duty of care to make sure that their staff, their employees, their team members are in a, and I, when I say safe environment, it's safe mentally, right? It's safe also that, that their mental fitness yes. is up to, up to par as well. Can you talk more about that? Because I, I really want to focus on thriving at work also from a mental health perspective. So I definitely think that we have our own personal responsibility. But let's talk about also, too, for anyone listening that is an employer, or they, maybe they're an employee and they really feel that, hey, I am not supported the way I need mm -hmm. to be supported yeah. in this environment. Talk more about that, the duty of care that employers have as well and employees need to be aware of. Okay. Well, it's a massive topic. 
where shall we start? So <laughs> this is something that I'm really passionate about because this was one of the first kind of turning points as I started to move back into kind of the world of work and find my purpose. It was like, right, I need to go out there and I need to help organisations to be able to help their people to transition through change, through challenging and changing times, whether that's restructures or whether that's, you know, something within their market or basically, well, what we've been through in the last sort of, well, 18 months now, isn't it? But um, yeah, so I was already kind of working with organisations like that. This is this sounds kind of quite contentious, let's say. So an organisation can make a decision, and this is some of the work that I do with organisations, about do they want to tick a box Do they want to make sure that they have put something in place? Because let's say it's the right thing to do or the fashionable thing to do. So it's a bit like the whole D&I thing, isn't it? It's it's the same thing. Do you want to weave something into your culture and create a psychologically safe culture where people feel that they can belong? Whether that be due to, you know, any kind of level of diversity or whether that be due to a mental health illness or stress. We need to create psychologically safe environments where people can feel that they can have a conversation. And there's different ways that we can do that. We can do that by raising awareness and educating people. We can do that by creating champions in our business. We can do that by, um, you know, working with the leadership within, within businesses and to be able to help them to understand that when we invest in the mental health and well-being and belonging of our people that they will get better results they will become an employer of choice they will be someone that everybody wants to go and work for for example sometimes it's a real conflict because what I in those first sort of 12 months let's say well, it's probably 18 months with the organize a lot of the organizations I was dealing with well we've got this budget for it it's we want to do it but we've got this budget and that's fine and I would let's say some well that's fine and do you want to do that this year or do you want to do something that's spread over a number of years do you want to kind of tick a box now or do you want to get to a place where it's interwoven within your culture and it's something that you build on year on year. Unfortunately, a lot of the organisations that I'm now working with, I'm still working with now, you know, they're the ones that have got that mindset. And it's about almost developing the soft skills of the people as well as the awareness. It's developing the soft skills of the people. It's helping them to develop resilience. It's helping them to develop you know, techniques for agility, techniques to be able to manage time, manage pressure, etc. So it's and also the huge things around kind of spotting the signs of stress and educating themselves on mental illness on kind of on spotting the signs of mental illness. And also some of kind of the reflections on actually how we are on growth mindset, for example, how we continue to grow and develop kind of as people. So some organizations really see that whole well-being piece as a huge and that mental fitness piece really as um as a huge investment and in a huge return on investment for the people that due to them wanting to stay with them and due to them wanting knowing that actually they genuinely care about their employees but you also still have you know organizations where it's like well this is supposed to be the right thing to do and that's where it becomes sometimes difficult for employees in that environment because mental health and well-being is something that evolves and it is something that we need to continually learn about just like for example like with diversity and inclusion it's a similar sort of you know it's it's something where you scratch the surface and there's still there's always more to learn about it. Oh, that, that that's good. And it's almost, I think, in certain environments, organizations, where, again, not to be controversial, or maybe to be controversial, that people don't want to know. Because when you uncover something and you start digging, 
It's like, oh, oh, what we'll find. And when you talked about that well-being and you talked about diversity and inclusion, I think some people see it as like an expense line. It's an investment. And if you don't take some time to study and educate the entire organization on these areas, they continue to unravel. It's like a domino effect where you continue to see negative ripples of these of not addressing situations, you can see them implode. And I think that it's one of those things. It's like, well, you know, what if we invest in diversity, inclusion, or mental health and the people leave? Well, what if we don't invest and they stay? What type of workforce and organization are we building? And I think another thing that you said that really stood out to me is, you know, it's not just a kind of like, oh, we'll look at it for a year. The, these types of studies and and really understanding the organization at, at its roots and where, where there's areas of opportunity, really, it's years. Because really to have lasting impact and change, I, I was brought into an organization and it was just a really broken team and, and broken uh, division when some of my colleagues and I came in. And it took a minimum of three years to start really seeing the impact of all the work that we had done since day one to really turn the tides. Because yeah. a lot of things, you know, in terms of a company culture and in terms of an organization, it's ingrained. You know, we've been doing this for decades and there's people um, that have been a part of the organization for decades and years that may have old ways of doing things or processes or even thinking. So to really start, you know, turning the wheel on that change, it's an investment and it takes time. And I think that's super important that, that you call that out. And having an organization that's really committed to that change. You know, you you mentioned like it can be controversial. Do you really want to know? You really want to make sure that you, um, you know, create that environment where you are the employer Mm -hmm. of choice. I think that's super important. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, when you talked about, you know, do people really want to know? Mm -hmm. And that is, they sometimes don't want to know because they don't know what to do. Mm. Yeah. So it's not just, it it can be that it's like, I don't want to know because that's not our culture here. And you're just expected to be resilient. But it can be that actually, I don't want to know because I don't know how to deal with it. Mm, And once I know, it's like I have to address it, right? I don't know how to deal with it. And once I know, it's like, oh, I got to do something. Yeah. And, but also, you know, it's like, well, where, where, what do I do? What if someone cries on me? What what if I do it wrong? Um, You know, all of those things. And this, and often, you know, it doesn't take that much upskilling to, you know, to help someone to do, you know, to to help someone to have, create a psychologically safe environment for someone to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And the, the key thing is, you know, if you're a leader of a business and you don't, and you have a bit of that feeling of that fear of actually if someone starts to open up to me, Ooh, what, you know, what do, what, what do I do? You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to listen. So oh, just listen, because listen, and then go and get some support or work with that person. They don't expect you to have all the answers. They just want to know that you're on their side. That's good. That is, that's super important when you are having meaningful conversations and dialogue in the space that I, 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 I want to call that out again. You don't have to have all the answers. Just listen. And as a collaboration, as a team, as a partnership, we can go seek the answers and seek what's the best way to approach this. So good. So good. Emma, you are phenomenal. I love that you are passionate about this work and really 
transforming, I think transforming the way people see their work and transforming the cultures within environments. So they are, as you mentioned, psychologically safe. So thank you so much. And before I ask my final question, where can everyone find you online? Okay, so you can find me at um, progressive hyphenminds.co.uk so that's the work that I do within workplaces but I also you can find me at um, the human reboot movement.com so when the pandemic happened last year I'd already got this kind of vision in my mind of wanting to be able to create something that would support almost take everything that I do with workplaces and put it into one place for individuals like me that would have benefited from that self-development if that makes sense so yeah so it's called so i've got a program called the human reboot movement but there's free resources and you can connect me with me on social and things like that there awesome and final question what is the greatest lesson you learned in your reset Okay, so one of the, well, just uh, there's loads, basically. There's about 26 things that I um, learned were crucial to my my reset or reboot, as I call it. So there's the self-development part, which I've already told you about, um, you know, self-development rather than development. So it's like, think about what you want to develop. Um, the other part is learning about sometimes when you're sad about something grief doesn't necessarily need to be about losing a person it can be having a loss of some description which can be anything so you know sometimes just be a bit kinder to yourself and the the other the the big one for me is learning to pause Mm. so I was on that hamster wheel wasn't I and just repeatedly you know, go, 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 next promotion, next promotion, keep going, keep going, keep going. I want, I want, I want, you know, not necessarily financially, it was just actually I want to progress, I want to progress. It was always in my head um, around that. And that for me, it was like, I'm doing that and I'm doing that for my children. But then in the essence, I never stood back and thought, actually, I'm not getting as much time with my kids as perhaps I would have wanted. And that whole learning to pause part is massive to me. So I walk twice a day, every day, and I get out in nature. So just get, put, you know, pause, walk, even if it's for 10, 15 minutes twice a day. That's, um, for me, just helps me to step out of autopilot to make sure that I'm making the best decisions for me and my family and my business. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Appreciate it. That was amazing. Learn to pause. Emma gave us so much to think about and reflect on regarding stress, well-being, and mental fitness. Stress review. Is it time and symptom relevant? I have some homework for everyone today, right? Who knew listening to a podcast, they were to get some homework. So homework today for employees and employers. Do you have a psychologically safe culture where people feel like they belong? Think about that. Marinate that. Marinate on that. Reset with Raven family. Thank you again for listening. Your support means the world to me. As always, if this message brought value, let us know. I'm Raven M. Harris on all social media platforms, and I'd love to connect with you. Come through on the gram, LinkedIn, the book, Let's Chat. And also support the podcast by emailing, texting, or sharing this link. Don't keep a good thing to yourself. There are so many people that experience stressful thoughts, career burnout, and career dissatisfaction. As a leadership coach, it is my goal to help lead people to the best version of themselves and reach their highest potential. Because remember, a reset is always available to you.